Hello everybody, how you doing today? I hope you're having a good day. I mean, if you were allowed and privileged to wake up today, God has given you an opportunity to do something for Him. So share the gospel message. Uh, just talk to somebody and say something about God to people you don't normally say things to. And who knows, you might get someone interested where they'll ask you about the hope that's in you. And of course, we're commanded to be ready to give an answer. And we should be there. If you're not doing anything that will promote, uh, provoke others to ask you questions about your faith, then you're really not demonstrating your faith. I think um, that's just kind of obvious, sound reasoning. All right, the title of the lesson is An Evangelistic Congregation. Now, the question is, do we want to be an evangelistic congregation? And this is one where all the members are seeking to help people get to heaven. And of course, reality suggests that there are very few of these congregations around. Many of them are just keeping house, uh, I mean, just, just waiting for the last member to die out in many of these congregations. And it's what it is, it comes down to a matter of want to. You know, it is totally up to us if we're going to be evangelizing, if we're going to be doing our, our, our duty. See, growth is an orientation. It's a way of thinking. It's not a program. Growth doesn't just happen. I mean, it comes as a result of an ongoing, consistent effort. And growth requires that a congregation must commit itself to becoming a growing church. And honestly, the preacher cannot do that by himself. Everybody's got to get on board. And the congregation as a whole must work. I mean, all who will, and they, they, they will do it. But the lazy members must not be allowed to stop the growth. Lazy, just because they're lazy, that doesn't mean we need to stop working. So, let's look at a few thoughts about uh, it being an evangelistic church and, and some, some ideas that different people have put forth over the years. And let's see how this works. In order to lead another to faith, one must first have faith himself or herself. See, faith motivates one to actively pursue the goals of Christ. We read that in 2 Corinthians 5, 14. And faith has a drawing power. I mean, if one has a strong faith, it is a drawing power. That's one has a strong faith is going to motivate others to ask about that faith. And a strong faith radiates and attracts like a light. And that's what Jesus said, let your light shine. And so, and of course, Paul told the Philippians, uh, they are lights in the world. So faith cannot be simulated by itself. I mean, it just can't happen on its own. But it starts small and it grows only when fed and exercised. I mean, that's what we have to do. Uh, you might have an initial faith, but it's not a very strong faith. But as you grow and develop and mature, your faith does get stronger. And that is the goal of every Christian. See, a church... And we could say a Christian who does not seek the lost, a church that does not seek the lost, is not faithful to Christ. You know, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, We are special people in the sight of God, but our purpose is to declare the excellencies of him with whom we have to do. And so our duty as Christians is to share the message of Christ and talk about God and tell people how they can be right in the sight of God. And so this is part of the great commission that Christ commanded uh, first to his disciples, then by extension to every Christian. And any congregation can become a growing church. But sadly, few are willing to do the work. They want to grow just by maybe if they have a bunch of kids, uh, they'll continue growing and adding members. But uh, going outside and bringing folks from from the lost, I mean, that, that's a rare thing these days. So, in order to be an evangelistic church, a congregation has to have a strong, clear message. 
1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, Paul was talking about the gospel by which they believed and they, were, they sincerely were saved by it. And the establishment of the facts of the death, burial, and resurrection is a semblance of um, the gospel. I mean, the clear message has to be strong. If you're going to be a member of our congregation, we expect you to work. I mean, it's got to be a clear message. A lot of people don't see that. A lot of people just want to come in and, and be a spectator, a pew warmer, and think that they've done their duty to God and just get out of there and not get active. No. True congregations want people who are active, who are seeking God. Um, and so... Uh, people who are seeking God want a church that stands for something. I mean, it's a mistake to think that a weak need approach will attract followers. I mean, tradition and dry rituals will stifle a church's growth and, and see what we're all about. I mean, I think that was the wrong thinking. And so what really attracts people are the people inside. So the building must prepare present a pleasing appearance at least to all five of the senses and as, make sure it doesn't smell it it's uh it's nice and clean people don't wipe their finger across the pew and find dust on it so yeah it's got to be clean and nice and and comfortable i mean some places they require air conditioning or heating depending on the the weather a church building should inspire reverence that's the reason we come here for the worship of God and our church building should inspire reverence, knowing that we're walking into a place where we're assembled to be with God. The appearance of the building reflects the attitude of the Christians who use it, when you think about it. Now, sadly, in a lot of congregations, one person takes the initiative to maybe vacuum the carpet or sweep the floor or wipe down the pews or something like that. All of us need to get busy and do something else to help it grow. Another thing about it, everyone must be made to feel welcome. I mean, think about this. Everyone who comes to the assembly must be made to feel wanted and accepted. And that's really the, the biggest drawing power. Yes, the gospel is what draws them in or what should draw them in. But it's the, the people. I mean, it's the members who show and express their love for one another. And this is one of the most important ingredients in, in building a congregation. You know, love between the members can be felt by all, even a first-time visitor. You know, when Jesus said, this new commandment I give you is you love one another, and, and everyone will know that you are mine because you love one another, John 13, 34, and 35. So everyone should be included in the loving fellowship. Every member should warmly greet every person in the assembly. You know, sadly, if, you're, if your congregation is a little bit large, you, you have little groups that you go and hang around, and you may not ever get around to meeting some of the others. I mean, I was part of a congregation many years ago that I'd been there probably about almost two years, and one of the elders came up and said, Are you visiting with us today? <laughs> so, I mean, okay. Enough said. We don't need to be that large. So the members must be taught not to dash out after, after services either. You know, some of them have a habit. As soon as amen is set, they don't want to deal with anybody. They don't want to talk to anybody. So they just run out. Sometimes we don't see them again until the next week or a couple of weeks later. But to fulfill their duty, they need to work to stimulate their brethren to love and good works. And you can only do that by talking to people, talking to our brethren, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. And every member should shake the hand of every visitor. I mean, anybody who comes in as a visitor, we, we need to do that. Sometimes visitors are going to try and rush out the door. Someone's got to go chase them down. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. And uh, catch them. Let them know that they're welcome and invite them back. Another thing we can do is make every assembly an occasion of joy. And really, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of the heart that this happens. I mean, yeah, we, we come in and pretty much we do the same thing week after week. But yet, we need to learn to enjoy it. 
and we we need to do this, but it, but but we need to keep it like on a professional level. I mean, it's, it's, we're not there for entertainment. We're not there for uh, meals and fellowship like that. Our great God deserves our very best and not cold, repetitive rituals. You know, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. I mean, the assembly should be relaxed, but reverent. A big problem is that in our culture, American culture, has changed the members of the church. Now they're not as focused on evangelism anymore because the American culture says, don't tell us about God. We don't want to hear about God. And people listen to that. And... They kind of go along with that. See, the sermons should motivate and not always be theological discourses. Yeah, I mean, it, and it, and sermons should be balanced too. Positive sermons, but then sometimes, yeah, it, it's required that you step on toes every now and then and pull the heartstrings and, and touch people's hearts and get into their heads. Sometimes that's what people need. And, and so... There is a place and time for all kinds of discourses of a spiritual nature. And sometimes, I mean, the needs of the congregation sometimes need to be addressed. And hopefully the preacher or the elders will determine we need this. We need more of this and get the preaching to be done that way. And yes, the singing must be joyful, enthusiastic and dynamic. I mean, it, it's, it's vital for church growth. I mean, people got to go there. People walk into a congregation and they're, they're leading singing it and you're the only voice you hear? I mean, that, that's kind of depressing, to be honest with you. Now, some congregations, they organize and plan for success. I mean, I, I'm not saying we have to go that far. Uh, we don't have to be so strict that we, we kind of like run spreadsheets and track everybody's... Uh, uh, job. I mean, everybody's business is nobody's business when you when it comes down to it. But sometimes uh, when we're trying to do certain efforts, someone does need to be put in charge, whether they're just a motivator, a um, organizer, or uh, basically keeping records. I mean, somebody should be in charge. Like when we have visitors. Well, somebody's got to see that somehow these visitors maybe receive a letter thanking them for their attendance or inviting them back. And somebody needs to do that. And of course, once again, it goes back to the idea of clearly formulated goals. Our goal is to do this. And sometimes in order to accomplish that, we've got to have more meetings uh, with the congregation to discuss these goals. And so that can either be in formal meetings or just the encouragement from the preacher and the elders. I mean, they need to, to get the whole congregation. We need to do this. And we want people to volunteer. And if you don't want to volunteer, we'll assign that. See, the whole congregation must buy into the goals. And like I said, that's why we have to let them know what those goals are up front. Because people who aren't interested in working, they're not going to go to a congregation that kind of demands that. They're going to go find a congregation that's going to let them do what they want to do. The goals could be written, at least discussed, and kept before all the members. And the goals should be mentioned all the time. Sometimes we can even mention them in our prayers. And it should be a part of every member's thinking what can we do to help the church grow? And whether you keep careful records or not, I mean, that, that's really, but uh, sometimes accountability is fundamental. If you've assigned someone the duty of maybe addressing cards to the visitors and uh, uh, thank you letters, then you need to follow through and make sure they're actually doing that. And, of course, it's like the person who's in charge of cleaning the furniture, vacuuming the floor. You go back and make sure that's actually done. So, yes, there is a measure of accountability in fulfilling all these plans. And, of course, all members must make sure that no one is left out of reaching our goals. So we need to involve all members who love God. All right. 
sometimes the members must train for success. I mean, every now and then a congregation will have a class on personal evangelism. Training is the difference between good and great. I mean, when you think about it, we can still teach people even if we have no formal training. But uh, yeah, if you have some training, that helps each one. And each, each member must know the gospel well enough to share it. Even if it's informally, as you're sitting there and uh, you're discussing this, this from across the table from somebody. Like I said, 1 Peter 3.15, we have to be ready to give an answer. All right. And um, so uh, we need to pick people for the various jobs and train them for that job if, if something special needs to be done. And average should never be good enough for the king of kings and lord of lords. When you think about that. We should never be average in our service to God, whether it's in the worship service or if it's fulfilling our duty to God. We should never be satisfied with average. Another thing a congregation can do is to get recognition in the community. Now, like I said, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And compare Matthew 5, 14, a city set on a hill should not be hid. See, everyone in the city or the area should know the name and location of the church. You know, in small towns, this is possible. Uh, but in a large city, at least the community, in a fair radius, should be aware of the church. I mean, within a four or five, six block area, people ought to know. And, and if someone come by looking for church, hey, how do I get to the Church of Christ? Well, they, well it's, it's around the corner here or, or go down this street and, and turn at the stop sign. I mean, things that we, we people can do, even people who really don't care about church, at least they're willing to give someone accurate directions. So people are more readily brought, brought into a church they know something about. Sometimes, yes, we need to educate people, and some people come in, have no idea what the Church of Christ is all about. So yes, that's when we have the opportunity for teaching. So sometimes we just need to advertise. And whether you go through uh, the newspaper and do advertising, uh, I know one congregation, we, we took out a, a, a weekly ad and uh, had a little gospel message and uh, invited people. And uh, we did get a, a response or two from that. And so, we need to advertise. I mean, wherever you go and you have the opportunity. Well, I'm a member at the so-and-so Church of Christ over on such-and-such -such Avenue. And advertise, advertise, advertise. And, of course, word of mouth is the best advertising. Okay, we've said all those things. And I saved the, the last one here for probably uh, the biggest emphasis. We can put all these things in place, but if we don't go, go do this other one, it's not going to amount to anything. It's not going to accomplish anything. The last one is go and seek. See, not just sit and wait for sinners to come looking for the church. I mean, a lot of, a lot of congregations, they, they wait for somebody to walk in the church, and then they decide, well, we can start teaching them. But no. Our duty as Christians is to go, just like Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I mean, when we say go into all the world, yeah, we're, we're not going to be going into the next state. We're not going to be going into another country around the world. But where is your world? I mean, think about that. Where is your world? The world is that's where you are. I mean, that, that's it. I mean, if you're in a grocery store, the people in that store, that is your world. Somehow you can set an example. If you have an opportunity, say something. Uh, make a nice comment uh, to the checkout person. And so, yeah, your world, your neighbors, the people that you know, your friends that you know by name. I mean, that's your world. So go and seek. You know, any farmer knows that the harvest comes only after the, the planting and the cultivating. 
and every member must be involved in some aspects of the growth process if the church is going to grow. And yes, we all have talents. Some have more talents than others. But the thing is, if you remember the parable of the talents, they got to be used. They got to be put to use. And so every member needs to give some amount of time every day to the work of the church, to the promotion of the church, to try and help people realize they have souls and those souls are lost if they don't change their ways. You know, it only takes a minute or two on the internet to get that message out. So consider that. So when we love with all our heart and then do whatever is in your heart to do. Yeah, we need to love people. Speak the truth in love. Uh, Philippians, I mean Ephesians 4 and verse 15. Speaking the truth in love. In Colossians 3, speak truth with your neighbor all the time. So, Whatever's in your heart to do, need to speak those things. And think on the things because they are good things to think about. I mean, this goes along with the will of God that all men be saved. And remember, it is God who gives the increase, but only after the sowing and the watering on our part. I mean, that's only what's going to happen. And people aren't going to turn on ABC or CBS and hear the story of the cross and be convinced that they need to obey the gospel. That's not going to happen. So folks, we need to go and seek the lost. That's what Jesus came for, and that should be our goal, and that should be our mission. All right, I got all these ideas from a lot of different sources, but anyway, think about that, and think about being a a evangelistic congregation, and do the more than just talk about it. You know, I've got an exercise bike. I keep telling myself, well, I'm going to get on that. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes on it here and there. And guess what? I'm still working on that first, first, uh, okay, enough said. But anyway, um, you have a good day today. Do something for God. Lord willing, be back again tomorrow with another lesson. Bye-bye for now.